and I actually believe, Whitney, I know a lot of people think I'm the crazy one, but I actually believe you can make more money by helping other people. I think the best kept secrets of success in today's world are those people who live their lives according to the principles that we espouse, the principles of selflessness and of putting other for others first and of going above and beyond, right? Like, like we have created a community of people who we have helped that go out of their way to try to help us. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Jonathan Kaiser. He's the founder of Kaiser, one of the most innovative and trustworthy technology-enabled occupier services and commercial real estate firms in the country. He's a number one Wall Street Journal best-selling author for his book, You Don't Have to Be Ruthless to Win, and he was named the Commercial Real Estate Disruptor by USA Today. He has also been named the top social capital CEO by the International Business Times. Uh, he's a highly sought after keynote speaker, thought leader, featured in over, an, over 150 articles, publications, and podcasts. And during the pandemic, was recognized as one of the top 20 virtual keynote speakers in the country. So great speaker today. But Jonathan, man, you're going to see his focus on helping others and what that has done for him. I, I, he's going to help you to think differently about the, every conversation that you have. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Honored to meet you and to have you on. I know you've uh, you're a pretty well known author. You're, you're doing some. You have some pretty amazing skills that I, I want to dive into today on the show. Uh, and I know you're going to help a number of people, uh, our listeners, say. But first, and who is Jonathan? Give us a little more about yourself, uh, and let's do it. Let's jump in. That sounds good. Well, I appreciate the invitation. Um, I have a unique upbringing. I was raised a Christian missionary kid in Papua New Guinea. My parents taught me to love, serve, give, and help. When we came back from overseas, I had this stark realization that my parents were poor, and that meant I was poor, and I didn't like being poor, and so I associated helping and serving other people with the poorhouse. So I got into commercial real estate because a buddy of mine said I could get rich. And as I got in, I realized, wow, this is a cutthroat, take no prisoners industry. Um, but again, I didn't want to be poor like my parents. So I became ruthless because that's what I thought it took. But I was miserable. I was misaligned with me with my core values, but I felt trapped. I didn't know a different way. And then over 20 years ago, a speaker on stage at a conference talked about a different way of doing business, a way of succeeding by helping others succeed. And I was moved and inspired and thought, I wonder if I could do this in commercial real estate brokerage of all places. And I wonder if I personally could do this. Um, and I went, I decided uh, to, to reinvent myself. That wasn't an easy decision, but I thought, man, if this was even possible, right? If I could, if I could win, if I could succeed, if I could get ahead by helping others and doing it the way that my parents raised me, wow, wouldn't that be amazing? And uh, today we've created one of the largest independent firms of our kind in the country. We only represent the user or the tenant of commercial real estate. And everything for us is about, it's we're a referral only company. And what we spend our time doing is helping others going above and beyond for other people. And it comes back in waves and we get waves of referrals. And so for me, it's, it's, it's this amazing story of you know trying to figure out how to get ahead as someone who didn't really wasn't raised with the tools to do so and you know went down the wrong path and then found the right path and now is uh i've decided that my mission in life is to change our industry and demonstrate that just like the name of my book you don't have to be ruthless to win love that incredible story and just appreciate your transparency too I think it just helps us all, right? You know, to know, hey, you know, you, you were a Christian missionary overseas. I mean, you come home and 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 figure out, man, the hard way, right? You said you became ruthless, <laughs> you know, and and then you came back and and uh, man, or, or, or you realized it didn't have to be that way. Yeah, and you mentioned though that you realized you were outside of your values. Yeah, you know, like, um, uh, yeah, and and then you learned it didn't have to be that way. So it's incredible or that you could help other, you could still make money while helping others at the same time. And I actually believe, Whitney, I know a lot of people think I'm the crazy one, but I actually believe you can make more money by helping other people. I think the best kept secrets of success 
in today's world are those people who live their lives according to the principles that we espouse, the principles of selflessness and of putting other for others first and of going above and beyond, right? Like, like we have created a community of people who we have helped that go out of their way to try to help us. And so it's this really, really fun experience. Instead of having to sell all the time, we can spend our time serving and helping and loving and giving and supporting. And then when we are given a real estate assignment, we go above and beyond for those folks. And then they become empowered ambassadors for our cause. And then they give us more referrals and they tell all their friends and the, and the, the pool just widens, right? The ripple effect goes out. So I'm not saying you can't be successful uh, being ruthless. Obviously, it's kind of the standard mode of operation for many, many years. And there's some very high profile people I'm sure we can all think of that behave in that way. But I just believe there's a better way. And I think it, it leads to a happier life as well. Well, let's talk about how you've done that. Uh, and I, I hope it's encouraging to the listeners as well. Uh, you know, in just how you, how to be successful helping other people, right? And, and you know, you mentioned there, you believe you can help or you can make more money by helping other people. Uh, and I, I believe that as well. And I know a number of other people who live that out a, a lot better than I, and it's encouraging. And, and uh, uh, so, but I want to hear how you do that. Uh, and what does that, what does that mean to you and your business? Sure. Well, a lot of people, when we talk about it, they, they, they have a hard time kind of getting their head around that exact question. Like, well, well what do you actually do? And, and so the way I like to describe it is, it's not that I'm necessarily doing something that you're not doing. What I am doing, though, is I'm keenly focused on listening and on probing to identify where there are needs. So I, I view every interaction with another human as the opportunity to find ways to serve. And most people look at it as an opportunity to try to sell or persuade. So just reversing the orientation of your approach to me is very unique. A lot of people are not used to being listened to, to really being cared about and heard in a business conversation. And I believe in the magic power of three. So I think that there's, there's, once you get to three ways to help somebody, my goal is every time I meet somebody, find at least three ways. I believe that, the, that once you hit three, you have wowed someone else. Uh, one's good, two is amazing, and three is like, who is this person, right? And so I, 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 the more that you can spend your time trying to meet the needs of others in interactions, and you can be doing the same thing you're doing, the same sales calls, the same meetings, whatever it is, just the orientation in those conversations shifts from you trying to push your wares or your services or your agenda to really trying to understand where their needs are. Because I've found that people respond much more favorably to you trying to help them than to you trying to sell them. I think people are sick and tired of being sold and they really want people that, that have their back and that are looking out for their interests. And so without telling them that's what you do, you just do it, right? You do it first. I see a lot of people that they go, well, yeah, if somebody helps me, I help them back. It's like, no, 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 you have that ass backwards. It's you help first, you go serve first, you go find ways to add value to them. Don't worry about if it comes back or not. And 80% of the time it will. Wow. Can you give us uh, some examples maybe of how you're implementing this or your team is or what that looks like? Talk about, you know, it, it coming back so many times over, right? W what does that look like within your, your business? Sure. So if we get introduced to someone, because again, we're referral only, right? So we'll get introduced to someone and we'll have a kickoff meeting and they'll want to understand who we are and what we do and how we can help them on the real estate side. And we're talking to them about creating a real estate strategy for their organization. But what I want to talk about when I get there is I want to talk about them, right? So I spend the time understanding their business, probing them. Every time they try to ask me questions about me, I sort of turn them back around and say, can I ask you just one more question? And my goal in that first meeting is to talk about me zero. My goal is to talk about them because they're the conversation that I want to have. Me, I already know about me. I want, I want to be in their world and I want to understand what they're doing and what their needs are and what their pain points are. And I want them to really feel like they have someone that can hear them. So 
again, for it's subtle, but it's, we could be in the same meeting for the same period of time. Most people are going to spend most of their time talking about themselves. I'm going to spend as little time talking about myself and talking about them because I feel like when I do that, one, I actually understand what their needs are so I can craft a solution that's far more customized. Two, they actually get the, the experience of someone listening and hearing them and being you know, in their court. Another example is we, we represent tenants across the country, around the world, and when we're helping them, a lot of times there's the tendency in our world and in, in the commercial real estate industry to try to negotiate longer term leases or higher rental rates so that the brokers get paid more. So another way to do it is to show in the negotiations that you're constantly trying to get them the best deal, not you. And that creates this unbelievable loyalty because then they go, man, this guy could this guy could get a bigger commission if he pushes for this, but he's not because he doesn't think that's in our best interest. He's pushing for the thing that he thinks is in ours. And then you may not make as much money on that transaction, but then they're your client for life. And they and 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 they go tell all their friends. And so you get a bunch of more clients. Whereas if you'd have been kind of penny wise and pound foolish, like, like most brokers, actually like most professionals in business are, where they're just trying to maximize their own gain. Um, I think you burn a lot of bridges that you don't even realize you're burning because people can tell. They're like, eh, I don't know if I really trust that person. So for us, it's like, man, if you just, everything you do, you just focus on, like pick the person in your life you love the most. For me, my family, obviously. So if you're, if, if this was your, your wife or your kid or your mother or your father or whoever that you were helping, how do you help them in a way that makes them go, wow, that dude really had my back. If you do that everywhere you go, you get more business, you don't know how to handle. And we're a living example of that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and man, it, it, it's, a it's not the, the natural thing we want to do, right. Is, is think about others over ourselves. You do have to work at it, right. It's, not, <laughs> we're not bent that direction, right. We're bent towards just thinking about number one, uh, yep. unfortunately. Uh, and yeah, that's the way it will be till the Lord calls us home anyway. That's uh, right. So, you know, uh, Jonathan, you know, speak to, uh, you know, what you all do now a little bit. Uh, and I, I know you all help tenants and, and with uh, negotiations, speak to the type of real estate you all are focused on and what that process looks like a little bit. Sure. So we, we represent tenants of office, industrial, healthcare, and retail. So the easiest way to think about what we do is who we represent. We don't represent landlords. We don't represent developers. We don't represent traditional real estate investors. We represent the companies that are occupying the office space, the manufacturing space, the warehouse space, the hospital space, the dental space, the you know restaurant pad, whatever it is, we represent the user, the occupier of that space. And whether they wanna buy, build, lease, sublease, sell, we're their advocates. So you think of us as like high level strategic consultants on the real estate side where companies like a Coca-Cola or whoever would have 50 people like at our firm in-house, we provide that outsourced real estate director um, mindset and expertise to mid-market companies. And most mid-marketing companies have, they have no idea what they're doing. Our industry is such a conflicted industry you know, you look at you look at um, the the legal world, right? In in law, you can't even hire a law firm without doing a conflict check. It's the 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 financial services world, people go to jail for conflicts of interest. And then there's the wild wild west called commercial real estate, where all these brokerage firms represent the landlords and the sellers and the buyers and the tenants, and it's all just one big, you know, conflict. And so for us, being one of the largest independent firms, if you include our uh, our international partners are about 570 people worldwide. We help companies have a better real estate strategy and then execute upon that real estate strategy so that they're, they're able to save money. Like you and I were talking about before the call, real estate is the second largest expense for most companies. It's the least flexible because you can lay off people, but you aren't laying off a lease. And over half of corporate bankruptcies involve breaking some kind of lease. So this stuff matters. This stuff is material. And so we bring that sort of expertise and sophistication to it on behalf of companies to help them be more 
uh, profitable, maneuverable, and uh, able to adapt to a changing world versus just these kind of static, long-term fixed real estate require um, obligations. Yeah. Speak to the, maybe the operator, you know, or the owner that's listening right now, uh, you know, that has maybe a tenant like this that's working with you all, like what should they know and what should they expect or how do they handle this? Well, we're very straight up. So the first thing is a lot of people try to play the games and we just don't play the games. We're a very straight up group and we always create competitive leverage. So we never allow our clients to just be negotiating on one option. It's always about creating an environment where the best opportunities win. So they know that. They know they're not going to get insider information from us like they can from the big firms. They know they're not going to have us steer clients towards their building because we threaten or cajole. Um, we're always going to do what's in the best interest of the tenant. So as long as they deal with us straight up and as long as they don't play games, it's going to work out well for them. If they don't, which often they don't, it usually doesn't turn out that well because that's our, our clients want to have a partnership with a, with an owner and a landlord that is a good partner. You know, I just got off the phone with a client who during the downturn, um, they were asking for some rental relief during the pandemic and uh, the landlord played games, asked for a million pieces of information, basically did a deep dive on their business and then came back and said, Oh no, we're, we we're, we don't do rental relief. So it basically uses an opportunity to um, extract a bunch of uh, information about the company that 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 was undue. And so now the 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 directive is our lease is getting close to expiration. We don't want to be with this landlord. Please move us. So that may have seemed like a smart, calculated decision by the landlord at that point, but it burned a bridge. And that's what happens everywhere in our world. And so. You know, having somebody that's got their back, that's taking care of them, that's not letting these landlords, developers, and brokers who are aligned against them take advantage of them is what we stand for. Yeah, yeah. So how do, I, I guess, give us a, uh, uh, maybe an example recently of working with a, with a client and, and, the, and the, uh, uh, the owner or the, I don't know, I was just trying to think of an, an example. You could do this better than I could. Um, I don't know, just a recent example where you all have had to step in and help and, and what that looks like. Or I was trying to think about the listener, though, who's thinking about who has a building like that. And I don't know, just trying to educate them on what that looks like to work yeah, through I mean, I, problems I with the tenants. I, I, I think it's simple, right? I mean, it's I'm not saying it's not complex at some level. There are a lot of complexities to the deals we negotiate. But I mean, I think the approach is simple. The approach is do the right thing be your word, you know, uh, t tell the truth, try to work with people as a partner. It's not that complicated, but people are always trying to play games and trying to extract an unnecessary pound of flesh. And I think that that hurts them in the, in the, in the long run, because, you know, nobody likes being taken advantage of, and they usually don't forget it. And everybody's connected. So I spend my time going around trying to spread goodwill. Most people in my industry spread the opposite. So while they still may have plenty of success and they still may make a lot of money, they don't find themselves surrounded by a community that trusts them or likes them, right? And that, to me, that's the biggest loss ever, right? Like what, what's the point if you don't, if you don't, if you're not surrounded by a community filled with love, I just don't, I don't see it. Like, so you have money and what are you going to do? Go on a yacht by yourself and, you know, like, or have fake friends. That's so fun, like, is it? It's not yeah. fun, right? Yeah. Why, why not just create a community by doing the right thing and being a trustworthy person? And, you know, and so that for me is at the, at the, again, the, the devil's in the details, right? Cause every deal is different and everybody has different requirements and the lenders and et cetera. But if you are a straight up person, I have found the most successful landlords are the ones that are straight up. They don't play games. They don't talk out of two sides of their mouth. They're fair. They're reasonable. They communicate. Um, and those are the ones that tend to do the best. What are some ways that maybe a seller should be aware that tenants can break their lease? Breaking leases is tough. It's tough. Um, it was certainly tested during the uh, pandemic. Um, very few people got out of their leases uh, under the force majeure clauses. So 
Um, and now, now that that's happened, of course, everybody's writing those into the leases, so they for sure can't be. Um, but, you know, it's our experience that, you know, the, the walk away from the lease and sue me and see what you, you get strategy doesn't usually end well. Um, there's very few success stories that I've heard where that happens. I mean, sometimes you have to do it. Sometimes you don't have a choice, but um, most of the time it ends up following you on your credit report or yeah. hurting the company's credit for a long time. So I never think, I think there's always better solutions, renegotiations, uh, termination payments, subleasing assignments. There's always other ways to try to skin the cat. I, I, I think the middle finger approach doesn't tend to bode well for, for most people. Right. Right. I, I wanted to jump back a little bit, you know, on the three ways to help someone are, is there a, even a more specific, like a specific example? Well, I was just trying to think like some sure. people say, well, I want to add value to these people or, you know, investors or that kind of thing. But sometimes it's difficult to like think outside the box. So what value would, would look like for that individual? Just uh, give us some guidance there. Absolutely. So I have found that what it really requires is deep probing and uh, intentional listening to find it. So I always try to understand what's going on in people's world. Usually there's at least one thing personal, whether that's a book I send somebody, whether that's something that their kid needs, whether that's that you can find something on the personal side. And then everybody always could, could use a connection. I love the connection side of, of helping people. So trying to figure out, hey, if, you know, are there any, is there anybody in your world that would be helpful to know um, and then when they go, well, what do you mean? And I say, well, you know, and I walk through different, different folks relative, because again, I've been listening, actively listening to them. So I'll say, based on what you told me, would this person be useful or would this person be useful? And I like to make an introduction. And then the third one is always like my favorite, right? Because the third one is always sort of this unknown where most people, because they stop after two, they never really get to the third, but the third is the icing on the cake. And so you know, the third can be anything business oriented, maybe a double down of number two. Uh, it could be another thing that you do for them personally. Um, I, I have done some of the most unique and creative things for people that had nothing to do with me getting a business, or maybe it was just something that they had a they had trouble with or helping them find, a, you know, making connections for them on a potential hire. I mean, just Literally, it's anything, Whitney. It's anything that that comes out of their mouth that's a that's a pain point. Most people just glaze over it, and I dig into it. I'm like, oh, there's an opportunity. Yeah. How can I help them with that? Or sometimes, I at, at the risk of sounding even corny, sometimes people just need to be heard. Yeah. I've been in plenty of meetings with people where I ended up just listening, and they told me their pain, and I just empathized, and I sent some follow up books and stuff that might be helpful or. You know, people would always laugh because they'd come in and I'd, I'd be hugging this person and there'd be tears. And it's like, what is going on around here? And I thought this was a, a business meeting, but it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't have those boundaries around, around that. I'm there for that person. If that person needs something, I'm going to do whatever I can to help them. Um, and sometimes it's just a shoulder to cry on because most people in today's world just don't care. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think so much it goes to what you said early on. It's like the focus on like helping this individual from the beginning, like at the beginning of the conversation, that's what you're focused on, you know? And so you're focused on listening, right? And it's better listening, uh, but listening in an effort to help them, right? And often we're just listening in a way to help ourselves. Uh, you or know, waiting and, for them to shut up so you can talk. That's right. right. Tell them about how amazing you are. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, enough about you. Now, here's more about me. You know, it's like no one right. cares. No one cares. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, there's some saying I can't remember it exactly, but you know the way the, the you know the best way to flatter somebody, right, is to let them talk about themselves. <laughs> you know, something like that. Uh, but no joke. You know, it, it's like people do feel heard and feel cared about, right? When you just listen. And so I, I'm I'm grateful for you just stressing that because I, I think so often, even with uh, and I don't take. Uh, all the investor calls now, but when I used to take them all, 
that was a big thing I would try to do. I'm trying to ask them, right, about them and ask them about their investment strategies or how we can help them, right, with their current situations or, or you know, something I used to lead with, uh, you know, was like, you know, what prompted the call today, right? Or how, yeah. you know, and so right away, they're telling me their pain point. And so guess what I'm going to focus on? You know, I want to try to help them with that thing. And often, even for what you said, it would give me some reason to follow up. Right. If I, you know, there's some kind of educational thing I could find them or whatever it may be. But two, I would say, Hey, what do you do for fun? And that would catch people off guard all the time because they're, they're not, they're not expecting me or, you know, like some kind of investment firm to ask them something personal. Right. But it, it then it lends to something about their kids or their family or where they went on vacation or, right. It adds that element, just like you're talking about, uh, you know, that personal side a little bit, which I'd love to be able to follow up on as well to, Hey, how was Johnny's? soccer game right uh and so that's that's crucial you know so uh, I, I love those points tell me um jonathan you know with with your you know uh, take on the industry right now your business I, I would like to know you know, what's your best advice for passive investors right now i think that there's a lot of opportunity in <clears throat> most of commercial real estate i think it's a safe harbor um in industrial in particular so looking at industrial opportunities, looking at, a, I mean, there's basically as long as you're not office right now, I think you got a lot of opportunity. Uh, office is challenging. And obviously with the financing um, concerns that started with SVB, there's been some pullback on the multifamily side. But for the most part, there real estate investors are alive and well, and there's a lot, a lot to invest in. So, you know, I always am careful. I, I don't want to. I don't want anybody to ever make an investment decision based upon my statements, but I, I, I'm very bullish on the market in general. I think the office sector certainly has some pain coming, um, but I think in general, there's a lot of good opportunities out there today. What are some of the most important metrics that you track? Could be personally or professionally. Uh, well, they're different, right? So for me, on the on the professional side, I'm constantly tracking the kinds of activity that we have within the firm, how many, how many projects, what the, what the total value of those projects are, you know, through to the life cycle. And that's the lifeblood for our business. And so always having a, a, a pulse on that is, is really important. And then when you micro it down, it's looking at how many new meetings we're getting and how many new conversations, how many referrals, all that stuff. For me personally, it's, I'm always trying to focus on how many people am I serving. So that's really where I, I am. It, it, I don't, I try not to go a day without at least one person. And usually it's a lot more, but just making sure that no matter how successful or busy we get, that we stay in the mode of what we're, what we're wired to do, which is to help others. Yeah. Love that. Uh, what about uh, any habits that you have that you're disciplined about that have produced the highest return for you? I'm a grinder, man. I think that is something that started with the four hour work week and, you know, all the, all this other nonsense that unfortunately the younger generations have been sucked into. And so, you know, feeling, feeling like they should never have to work and it should all be handed to them is something that I see everywhere in the world. And I think it's a shame. So for me, it's the discipline to, to grind, the discipline to, to do the things that I don't necessarily feel like doing when all I want to do is sit on the couch or go for a run, right? Like making sure that I'm grinding. And I think that that's, that, that is by far the thing that is, that has served me the most. And then I always don't, uh, since I was young, I forced myself to do the uncomfortable that I thought was necessary for my own growth. So focusing on things that put you in that, a um, little bit uncomfortable here, in in my opinion, that's a, that's like a that's a green light, right? That's like unless it's towards something you know bad or something. But I'm describing it in the things where you're pushing yourself and you're putting yourself in situations that are going to grow you and where you might feel under like you're not quite at the level. I've all I've lived in those places, and so by the time by the time you know I'm 48, by the time you're 48, you You've had so many life experiences. You're really afraid of it. Nothing, right? Like that. There's no stage. There's no presentation. There's no meeting. There, there's nothing that causes me 
to raise my blood pressure one iota because I've been there, done that so many different situations. Um, so yeah, so pushing yourself, getting yourself outside of your comfort zone, never sitting back and, and, and being, you know, lackadaisical, not that you don't relax. I like to relax like anybody, but, um, but just making sure that you stay focused on, on maximizing your opportunities because you only get this one life, you know, and I, yeah. I want to look back tired and exhausted and said, man, I left it all in the field. Not boy. I wish I'd have tried harder. Yeah. No, I love that. It, it is a daily grind, isn't it? it, it but uh, what about, and we've talked a lot about this on the show today, but how do you like to give back? Maybe a favorite way or something. I like to give back in every possible chance I get. I, I like to give back through who I be. You know, I come from a state of service from a mindset, from a state of being of service. And so for me, what is the most valuable thing is to make sure that I'm staying in that mode as much as possible. Um, and that is much more value. Anybody can write a check, right? Serving somebody in the moment when you're tired and don't feel like it or busy, that's that's the discipline. That's where, you know, so for me, giving back. Plus, I have five kids, as you can see behind me. So spend a lot of my time. Uh, with all the joys, the the joys of parenthood. Uh, and some of those joys, as many of you parents will recognize, are are less joyful than others. But you know, I just I love being a dad and I love I love trying to raise kids that are gonna be good examples into the future and and have the you know give us hope for the future. Um, so yeah, so that's a big investment of my time as well. For sure, no doubt about it. That's definitely a way to give back. Uh, but yeah, I love being father as well. I love, I appreciate you just elaborating on that, but really your, your desire to give back. And I think helping us change our mindset, right. Or the way we think about the next conversation, uh, you know, I just think it's crucial. Uh, and I, I couldn't agree with you more just about going into the conversation with how can I help this person versus what am I going to get out of it? Uh, it, I know it changed things for me and I'm still working on that. It's not something I've mastered by any means, um, but I think it's a lifelong thing, but it does start somewhere. Well, and I would, and I would just say to that, it's not like one of my favorite quotes that I created is selflessness is selfish. I say that everywhere I go. So I'm not trying to say, Hey, go give away the farm and go broke. What I'm saying is I truly believe, and I'm living it in arguably one of the most ruthless industries out there, that the more you help people, the more it comes back. So if you just focus on the giving, the sowing of the seeds, uh, and don't worry about the reaping, the reaping sort of takes care of itself. It's, it's, it's when people either try to do instant gratification and go, well, I helped one person, I didn't get anything in return. It's like, you're missing the entire point, man. This is the long game. This is... Yeah. This is creating a reputation for being that person that helps people, not for going and doing one act of service that then you're expecting a return, which is sort of this creepy, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's creepy. It's like, hey, I'm going to pretend like something's a gift, but it's really not. It's a trade, but I'm not going to tell you it's a trade. I'm just going to pretend like it's a gift. But if you don't realize it's a trade, then you're cut off. It's like, that is the creepiest thing I've ever heard. So when most people try to do service, that's what they do. They they do this sort of bastardization of it versus, man, if I just focus with everything I do on how much value I can bring to everybody that I'm with, then over the long haul, it's going to shake out pretty nicely for me. John, then how can listeners get in touch with you and learn more about you and your book? Well, you can always buy the book on Amazon. And if you buy it on Amazon, leave me a, leave me a very positive five. I love those. Uh, you don't have to be ruthless to win by Jonathan Kaiser. And then Kaiser.com is the website, K-E-Y-S-E-R.com. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to LifeBridgeCapital.com and start investing today.